Eccoci. Allora, so, cominciamo. Uh, here we are again. Let us begin with this round table dedicated to the topic of the acidification of oceans. Um, as we heard from Massimo Chiappini, this is one of the most important topics that the challenges that lie before us. The other is undoubtedly also the issue of the impact of microplastics. And um, <clears throat> we heard also about intensive fishing and um, the dwindling fish stocks. And um, during this round table, thanks to the different uh, participants, we're going to try and understand what this is all about. So how this problem has uh, emerged, how it is developing, and what are the projections concerning this problem? And then also, how can we take action? How can we act in order to fight against this phenomenon, also considering the impact it has on living organisms which live in the oceans? We heard Massimo Chiappini remind us that the ocean is very important and we only realize its importance when something doesn't work anymore. Um, so we are sort of used to this well-being that comes to us from the sea, although we are not aware of it. Um, so we heard about the absorption of heat. Um, and there is a figure that really struck me. It is the fact that according to estimates, since the Industrial Revolution to the present day, the ocean has absorbed 93% of excess heat, uh, which is kept uh, in the atmosphere through greenhouse effects. And if this had not occurred, the main temperature would have been, would have increased by 36 degrees. So this is, gives us an idea of the role played by the oceans. So, so let us now try and, uh, and get into the gist of the topic of the acidification of the oceans. And we will do that with some speakers who are here at the Santa Severa Castle, others are with us uh, remotely connected. I wish to say hello again to the um, Director General Emso Eric, to his left, Marco Galeotti, who um, is the Program and Inter Industry Relation Officer of Emso. To the right, there is Marco Riveri, Professor of Zoology and Director of the Biology uh, department, Charles Darwin, of the University of Rome. And then remotely connected, we have Vanessa Cardina, a senior researcher of the Oceanography and Geophysics uh, Center of Trieste. Good afternoon, Vanessa. And, uh, and uh, there should also be with us uh, Jaume Piera, project coordinator uh, at, uh, from the Institute of Marine uh, science is not here with us yet, but um, he's connected remotely from Spain, Barcelona. So I would like to begin by giving the floor to Marco Galeotti, because uh, earlier in the introductionary um, session, Juanco Daniel Bay showed us uh, infrastructure and monitoring um, places, well, spots of EMSO Eric. So please tell us more what EMSO Eric does and how it conducts uh, its activities. So thank you, Marco. If I may have the slides, as Marco said, I am the Program Industry Relations of Officer for EMSO. And I would like to begin today by introducing EMSO, um, speaking about the way in which it is structured, um, its mission, its services. And since I'm the first speaker in this session, I will like I would like to introduce the notion of sea acidification to tell you what is happening and um, how EMSO is monitoring this phenomenon. So as you can see from this slide, EMSO is the multidisciplinary, uh, not multidisciplinary observatory that um, uh, observes uh, a number of essential ocean variables. When we speak about the column of water, water column, it is a notion that is not so commonly known, but we mean this ideal column of water that begins from the sea surface getting to 
the sea bottom, and it is made up of five areas zone with with very different uh, features. EMSO is a European structure distributed with its own legal status, uh, assigned um, by the European Commission. It's um, EMSO plays a part in the European research area, and it participates in 15 European projects. So in this slide, we see the various countries that participate in EMSO, and there are eight. And of course, we've got Italy, which hosts uh, EMSO at the INGV, then France, Greece, Ireland, Norway, Portugal, Romania, and Spain. The number of people involved as a whole is about 110 persons, and the total number of organizations is about 27. <clears throat> now, so you've uh, seen this map before, presented by our director. It is the geographical distribution of, of the observatory which participate in EMSO. And as you can see, we've got observatories that go from the Atlantic to the Aegean up to, to the Sea of Norway. Uh, but also the Black Sea. Um, as to the parts uh, that of the water column that we monitor, we have observation of the surface, and then we get to depths of 3,600 meters in the Canary Islands, 3,000 in the Norwegian Sea, and 2,100 in the Ionian Sea, just to mention a few. Then I don't know if you can see those green dots, a smaller one in the slides. Those are the, these are test sites, which are located in surface waters around 20 meters, and um, they are used to test new sensors and apparatuses. Um, after briefly introducing our structure, I would like to speak about the mission of EMSO. EMSO, um, as a European institution of, ex of excellence, it supports research in the field of the marine, marine um, environment concerning climate change and geological hazards with the aim of promoting the protection of marine resources and also understanding the complex interactions, some of the various inter uh, components of the biosphere. Um, and the challenges we need to address uh, along this research journey are those that have been defined by the European Commission within the framework of the blue growth, which represents a contribution of the marine uh, environment in reaching the so-called Europe 2020 strategy for a smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. So, and the challenges are these, monitoring global warming, the acidification of the seas, evaluating the impact and the sustainability of the exploitation of marine resources, carrying out uh, real-time observation and developing rapid alert system for earthquakes and tsunamis, mitigating the impact of climate change on the marine ecosystems and the analysis of the interaction among the various components of the biosphere. Now, one of the main measurements adopted by EMSO to reach these goals consists in adopting within every observatory a standard configuration of the equipment. And the main piece of equipment to do that is, sorry, and the main solution is to provide every observatory to with what we call the EMSO generic instrument module, uh, EGIM, which includes a number of standard sensors that can produce data with the same features so that they are interoperable by definition. Um, and uh, by, well, our team um, produced a scientific paper on frontiers uh, um, in marine science. There is a link at the bottom of the page. So the 10 year period between 2021 and 2030 has been declared by the United Nations as the decade of the oceans and to fully participate. And so together with the colleagues from the French Institute, uh, Ifremer, the Japanese from JAMSTEC and the Canadian from ONC, 
three of the most important institutes uh, in the world in the marine sector proposed to the United States and uh, the United Nations uh, an action called One Ocean Network for Deep Observation. And uh, this action is aimed at uh, strengthening cooperation, which already exists with the institutions that deal with the sea at the world level, uh, establish new partnerships in the private sector, involve the public, the general public, accelerate technological transfer, and strengthen the idea of a global coordination to develop political strategies for the sea, which are aligned among the different continents. Now, moving on to concrete instruments, which are used by EMSL to, to transfer to the scientific community and all stakeholders the results of its activities. Well, the main thing, the main role is played by our data, our portal. There is a link on the slides if you want to access it. And on the portal, you may find a list of our facilities with the possibility of displaying the data made available and with a series of tools that we developed in order to process data. But um, now I would like to move on to the topic for this session, in other words, that of the acidification of the oceans. And I wanted to start quite simply by giving you an overview of what is the main variable to measure acidity in a solution, which is pH. And uh, as we will remember from high school, there is this definition which passes through this logarithm concerning the concentration of this positive um, hydrogen ions. Now, pH may vary between 0 to um, 13. A neutral solution um, has a, a pH equal to 7. Below 7, it is uh, acidic. Above, it is alkaline. alkaline. The average pH at C is 8.06. So the, the, this is what the sea is like, is alkaline. As far as the acidification of the sea, a main role is played by CO2, um, which is produced by the combustion of fossil fuel. If we continue to focus on the chemistry of the sea, the basic reactions that make CO2 important uh, in this uh, acidification phenomenon are those that you can see on the slide. In other words, CO2 in the sea, which uh, interacts with water, forming carbonic acid, uh, which is not very stable and therefore decompose, breaks down spontaneously, releasing these hydrogen ions that we were mentioning before, and uh, which play a part in determining pH. So. Uh, atmospheric CO2 has increased over the years, and the seas have continued to absorb it in greater amounts. This absorption, on the one hand, as we heard, has reduced uh, global warming effects. So, in a sense, we should thank the sea for doing this. But the price which our seas are paying is very, very high because this acidification, as we shall see also in the with the other speakers, brings about rather significant consequences. But uh, let us take a look at how the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has changed and how the pH of the seas has changed in the past centuries. The first thing is that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere in the past 200 years has moved from 280 parts per million to the current 421, according to recent NASA data. As a direct consequence, the average pH of the sea in the last 200 years has decreased from 8.2 to current 8.6. And only since 1985 to the present day, the acidity of the seas has increased by 30%. So we are talking about a significant increase uh, in the past decades. Um, so having said this, I would like to give you a brief overview um, of what our organization does in order to monitor uh, this. EMSO has 14 observatories located in the seas all around Europe and all um, survey or collect, well, they survey pH and CO2, but 
just to give you some concrete examples, the first example which you see here is that of Emso Canary Islands, where our colleagues manage a mooring, which is a cable attached to a, a, a surface boom, which extends to the seabed. And this reaches 3,000 over 3,000 meters, it has uh, several three uh, measurement stations. And in this case, pH is uh, measured by uh, a sensor which is uh, located um, on the buoy. Then there is also uh, Emso Hellenic Arc in Greece at the station of pillars, part of the Poseidon uh, network made up of six, six moorings. Um, and specifically, in the case of pillows, the, our colleagues measure, among other things, the pH of the sea, but this time at uh, 1,670 meters. And uh, if you are interested, I've, there are the links um, on both slides. And uh, with this, my presentation is finished. Thank you. Thank you, Marco Galeotti, for drawing this picture of uh, the activities of Emso Eric um, and to telling and for telling us what they do. So we heard some keywords such as interoperability and the communication of data. So um, I would like to ask now if Vanessa Cardin is connected because we would like to give her the floor. So please let me know if she is available because precisely one of the aspects uh, highlighted by Marco Galeotti was precisely the issue of data sharing. And uh, EMSO ERIC is already a uh, great cooperation, but there are also research, other research institutes, that, uh, as in the case of OGS, which study, they have been studying for a long time um, all this, and um, they monitor um, the oceans and marine environments. And one of the great challenges in preparing for this meeting um, is precisely data sharing and the ability to communicate them easily um, and for them to be actually shareable. So I would like to ask Vanessa Gardin to tell us uh, what she does, what uh, they do and uh, OGS does and what how they operate uh, uh, in the Mediterranean. The floor is yours. Um, buongiorno. Buongiorno a tutti. Good afternoon. And thank you for inviting me. I would like, well, not just to share with you what OGS does, because OGS is part of a network of monitoring, and it participates in several programs, research programs. Allora. I would like to share my screen. Okay. And actually, the um, European observing systems support, of course, all of the um, studies relating to climate change and mainly the role of the uh, operational oceanography in climate change. So if we reiterate what was mentioned already by Marco and by the other speakers, well, all this concerns all of the oceans and the seas in the world, and even more, having considered the condition of um, sea um, as the Mediterranean, it is also, uh, let's say, a uh, part of a concentration of CO2 and carbon dioxide, which have increased from 280 ppm to over 420 ppm. There is, say, over 50% more than the beginning of the industrial area in Iraq. Global. E facendo, eh, subendo un'alterazione. 
and there's therefore an alteration of the pH. And also, the pH is moving towards pH 7, that is, say, neutral. So the causes were mentioned already, just to, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, underline that, well, we all know that the increase in uh, the anthropic activity and also with the fossil fuels and deforestation and uh, uh, the construction activities and also uh, a change in the destination of use, which have uh, led to uh, tons of CO2 in the atmosphere in 2019. And fortunately, however, only half of the CO2 released by these activities has remained in the atmosphere, showing that the ocean um, has been uh, an important, uh, let's say, provider of CO2. But the Mediterranean, as well as other uh, basins, has undergone an acidification process over the years. And according to some recent studies, in the next decades, this phenomenon may continue. And uh, also in summer 2021, the pH might be lower, especially in the southern uh, parts of the Mediterranean and at a depth of, a fi of 50 meters, especially along the African coast and uh, just close to Alexandria, Egypt, and uh, in Turkey, and also with an involvement of the sea between the Balearic Islands and Sardinia and the sea, the Crete, the sea of Crete. However, in order to understand how can we collect this data? Well, we need data first and foremost. So like funds, of course, because without funds, we cannot do anything. And also shared methodologies, especially at the global level, but mainly at a European level. So this is a fundamental role In a fundamental role in the study of climate change. And for those of you that are not expert, well, this is defined as a set of activities for the generation of services and products that provide information on the marine environment and the sea and the coastal areas. And this is linked to the observation. and uh, then the observation of uh, the activities and also the atmosphere. Marco mentioned the importance of sharing, but also the standardization and the ability to share and compare data. So the forecasts are used for ocean models that generate products which describe the present condition and which are given by the data coming from the observation and then provided according to the different analyses. Then we have the forecasts and which are based on these models. and also by using our previous data. Shortly, how does this system work? Well, we have a system, as it was also mentioned, for uh, several, let's say, uh, structures. We have the uh, observation and uh, also we have the data management phase, which is very important. Uh, and uh, then uh, we fuel the various systems and the forecasts. And we also have the products and services uh, because of course, this is what we study and it's necessary to share this information among us and through our network and the researchers, but also with the 
community, generally speaking, and uh, also with the different stakeholders and also with the different users. And I'm sure that they are going to provide, of course, a feedback in order to better understand whether the design that we have used is the right one. So in this case, for instance, we have a number of models and among these models, for instance, uh, and for the waves, we have uh, systems as these ones, and also for acidification. So um, what, what are the initiatives adopted at a European or a global level? Well, in this case, we have, or we can, define the three main groups. That is to say, the European Research Infrastructure Consortium, uh, where, which Eric is part of. And also, uh, I will not, of course, comment on it because Mark commented it already. And we have ICOS, uh, which is the Carbon Integrated Carbon Systems. And more specifically, as regards uh, the acidification, we have the ICOS network, which is the network that provides ocean long-term um, observation. And this is necessary to understand the current status and better check the future behavior of carbon and also uh, anything relating to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the atmosphere, and uh, the marine part. And then the quantification of flaws, as we will see, as we see also in this slide, indicates that basically this monitoring is not just uh, for instance, what we want to see in the Mediterranean, but also what happens at the at the Atlantic level, because there is also an input there in order to take into consideration the measures. And uh, also we have uh, fixed stations or the observatories, which are the three ones we see here. And also we think about using fixed and reiterated and repeated stations so as to have a monitoring which is suitable and also in order to um, contribute with more data and uh, on a regular basis. And of course, this was already mentioned and done in the past and also within other projects like the uh, fixed tree and cargo motion. Then uh, how can we actually study all this. We can do that also as it happens with TARC and also ICOS and also what the Italian the Italian contribution also through the different uh, observatories and in which we have uh, for instance the Adriatic Sea and also that are part of uh, ICOS and the um, southern Adriatic, and also the deep uh, area of the Western Mediterranean, and also Lampedusa, and uh, we see also the AOV, which are the variables which are already defined at a world level, in order to contribute to the uh, processes relating to climate change. Just to give you an idea, uh, 
This is uh, uh, located uh, at uh, 1,200 meters. And one of the most important things to mention relates to this type of observatory. And in particular, it provides uh, high frequency measures and it allows to have a time frame, an extended time frame, and also important information in the variables are measured. So, uh, and also in relation to the zooplankton. We also have European plans and projects and uh, we have uh, all of the related projects and also a specific one relating to the Mediterranean, which is called the science we need for the Mediterranean Sea we want, which is under the Italian uh, leadership and the CNR, and also the financing for the study of this uh, uh, situations like the acidification and uh, other processes that through uh, specific forms uh, um, allowed to have um, the chance to meet these specific needs. And then we also have networks, including Mungus. It is very important to work together. There's nothing we can do uh, because, well, of course, we know that it is necessary sometimes to work alone because each country has to provide resources. And uh, one of the uh, new networks that we have is uh, the Mediterranean Ocean Acidification Hub, which is a network that connects uh, the Mediterranean scientists that are interested in uh, the acidification of oceans, and in this case, of the Mediterranean Sea, and connect them to what happens globally. So this uh, uh, observation network has encouraged uh, the uh, formation of the regional hub in order to have a community uh, dealing with the efficient collection of data and comparable data mostly and uh, distributed uh, and uh, also its own effects and also to support uh, tools like the forecasts of the various models. And we also have a very important network that is uh, the Mugus network And uh, this is an active organization for, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the organization of and the coordination of operational oceanography in the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, Moon Goose uh, involves and includes 12 countries with 34 partners. And uh, they work together in order to share both data. And we have the observation and we have the models and we have the uh, application of the uh, data. And these are products that come from the uh, pillars, the first pillars, especially applied to climate change, uh, plastic, and pollution. And by way of conclusion, how can we improve, uh, for instance, uh, oh, after we see what the present situation is, the question is, how can we intervene? Oh, unfortunately, there were some connection problems, but no, it's OK. How can we improve the OA literacy and capacity building? So of course, che può ehm, aiutare la creazione di un public momentum, come viene detto, e, eh, specificamente per la 
eh, la necessità di adottare e implementare eh, specifico um, delle and especially it is possible to have specific actions especially in the uh, industrialized countries in the Mediterranean okay thank you thank you Vanessa Cardin for providing us with such a complex overview of uh, anything that it's done at the operational oceanography level and also to provide support to uh, the um, understanding of climate change. And uh, now we have collected the information on how to monitor the acidification in oceans, but then we have to understand how do we have to be concerned about it? Why do we have to uh, uh, reverse? Uh, and we'll probably have uh, clear ideas uh, thanks to what Marco Oliveira is going to share with us. And he is at the uh, La Sapienza University in Rome. And he will help us understanding what the impact of uh, ocean acidification on uh, marine uh, systems is. All right. And uh, Jaume has joined us. So thank you very much for being with us. Okay. I would like to ask you to please uh, put my slides on, on the screen. Um, so this is what I wanted to talk about. That is to say, uh, do you have an idea about how much all this costs? What is the cost for taxpayers when it comes to this commitment to study and monitor these parameters? Is it worth it? Is it worth to invest these resources or is it better to redirect these resources towards something else? Well, from my perspective as a biologist, I try to share with you my position on how, yes, definitely, yes, it's worth it. And no, we don't have to allocate resources to something else. Rather, we have to add resources because it is fundamental to have this type of information. Because the effects of processes as this one, that is say acidification on the biological organism, well, effects are there, they're heavy, and in order to know them, we need this type of information. This is the curve relating to the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, and its effect is the increase of ocean acidification. Let's see what happens in organisms. But before that, I wanted to make a clarification because acidification it's a word that entails the story of a process, a, a process that involves a lot of actors and also with a lot of faces. But this chart I'm sharing with you is the story and of a measurement of concentration of CO2 in water, which is directly connected to the acidification process in two completely different places, but in the same time frame. So a place uh, in is Hawaii in blue within the uh, Pacific Ocean, where everything, of course, uh, is uh, uh, somehow surrounded by water. And uh, uh, you see that over one year, uh, you see the CO2 concentration. But if we look at the long time frame, that's an increase, of course. And that is the average increase of the last years. So there are places as in the North Sea, and that is the Kiel Fjord, where also, uh, even if we just uh, look at what happens uh, uh, over one month, then there are variations in concentrations which are absolutely high. So the Mediterranean is in between. Uh, and uh, since all over the world and in our planet, in our planet, and that in the areas with water, there are so many diversified situations, because there is a, uh, let's say, mosaic of different situations, it is extremely important that our knowledge when it comes to data and monitoring is not just based on a station here and a station there, but rather on our uh, integrated quantity of data. And the other magic word I, word, I think it's integration here. Let us say putting knowledge together. So if, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the Americans have their own network and the Europeans have their own network of stations and the Japanese do the same, well, putting together this information and sharing this information becomes strategic. And the very last aspect, and uh, also, we have to consider to what extent this knowledge becomes a common heritage. 
these processes don't care about our reaction time. Um, So the higher um, disability, the higher the uh, possibility for us to react to these processes. That is why well, we are required this ability. And this is the reason why this is the solution, because the single researcher alone has nothing. I mean, if a single researcher is not working in an integrated way within a network, well, he or she has no chance to achieve good results. Then let's see what happens with acidification. Uh, of course, there are several problems. Um, and I group them into three macro categories. And um, we may even see them in detail. One, there's an increase in acidification in all of the organisms. Uh, with a, let's say, a sort of skeleton and think about corals, which have, or shells. Uh, well, they are eroded by the uh, increase of acidification or have difficulties in having uh, calcium carbonate uh, for structures because the pH lowers. For them, it's more difficult to have a shell or a skeleton, and this is vital for them. But as a matter of fact, the acidification acts and has effects on a huge quantity of biological processes of the organisms. And uh, I would like to share a couple of them to you because uh, they are quite striking. They are the last frontier we are working on. And uh, of course, they have to do with behavior. And uh, this, of course, has effects uh, from the point of view of the message that they, uh, of course, have. Let's start with the external structures. Uh, we know that there are some organisms, a series of organisms that have structures made up of calcium carbonate, which undergo defects of acidification. And uh, when I say uh, 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 of, uh, that is a negative thing, but of course, according to recent researches, uh, this is not true for all the organisms. Here I have four photographs of uh, four different corals. And at the top of the first line, you see two corals, um, which are very much famous in the Mediterranean. But these two organisms seem to be particularly uh, calcareous. And uh, probably this is the organism with the structures that look more a coral leaf, reef in the Mediterranean. And these two organisms seem to have the ability of, to be resilient. That is to say, they resist to acidification conditions as the ones that we estimate will be the conditions in 50, 80, or 100 years with the trend we are recording at the moment. So um, the, then the question might be, why? Well, probably uh, where there are tissues uh, of an interface uh, with the skeleton, they can somehow intervene and uh, be re resilient. For instance, this also happens in those situations uh, as, for instance, uh, in uh, uh, Stromboli, uh, the um, situations in which, for instance, you have the uh, fumarole and the water is identified and the pH is particularly low and they don't seem to suffer that much about it. Conversely, the ones at the bottom, that is to say the orange and the yellow ones, seem to be particularly sensitive to the action of acidification. I'm telling you so, because in uh, uh, if you, for instance, go to Zanone or Ponza or Genutri, you will, will probably uh, realize that These species are very close to uh, the the ones we see in the uh, in the images at the top of the slide. So although these organisms are very similar to one another, they're part of the same group uh, that the specialists are studying. Well, they have biological responses which are different. And also, there are a couple of examples. Let's say here we have a, 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 a shell 
And you see on the right hand side, from the bottom to the top, you go from normal situations up to particularly acidified uh, situations. And you see the shells that are progressively becoming eroded. And uh, then they have problems in having a robust shell. So what is the problem here? The problem is that this organism, um, if it doesn't succeed in producing a robust shell, uh, its uh, population suffer. Whereas on the other side, we have uh, uh, a number of photographs that show some more, a small and microscopical microorganisms that we don't see actually. Um, but in the ocean, so they play a fundamental role. And uh, also they play a fundamental role because these species, which is a macro, uh, space shift or spacecraft, uh, well, you see that the first one on the left is in a normal situation. The second one is in a situation in which there's an increase in temperature and also an increase in CO2. And the pH lowers and it starts to be um, uh, eroded. And then at the bottom on the right hand side, it's very much eroded. So these organisms are part of the phytoplankton. They are the ones that, for instance, uh, contribute to absorb uh, the CO2 that we uh, produce and release in the atmosphere. So they tend to temper, for instance, acidification, but the acidification that uh, uh, increases, well, it is detrimental. And then they are not able to, to remain at the surface. And they cannot participate any longer in the photosynthesis processes, which are the ones um, that should be the beneficial ones. And uh, then uh, they are direct and indirect effects, and they have a positive feedback. There's an increase in acidification, a decrease in their ability. Okay, some things that have really surprised me, this is a crab. I don't know if you have ever seen the female crabs. They keep their eggs under the belly, the fertilized egg. You can see them in the photograph. And they protect them until the little larvae of these small crabs come out. They're ready to live. Um, and so the, ex the first part of development is very sensitive. Uh, because, of course, the survival of that type of uh, crab uh, depends on the survival of the eggs. So there are all sorts of messages which are exchanged among male and female members of the species that promote a number of behaviors. So a number of these substances are hormones which are sent back and forth between the two, male, the male and female. They activate certain uh, behaviors for parental care. So they uh, oxygenate and ventilate the eggs and they take care of them. And it was discovered that acidification uh, damages some of these molecules, particularly uh, a proteic molecule that serves the purpose of activating this uh, behavior of care in the female so that to activate it, what is needed is a concentration 10 times as high. And if she doesn't feel it, she will not realize that she has to ventilate the eggs, etc. So acidification increases and the female ability to feel the stimulus decreases and the parental care on the egg diminishes and the population of the scrub decreases because the le because less eggs are going to, to reach uh, maturity, less lava, less scrubs, and overall there will be a decline declining trend for this uh, type of crab. Um, this is uh, um, um, a bust. There are some substances that are interpreted by the environment, within the environment, for instance, uh, through different sensors or um, abilities. And the fish um, sort of sniff the presence of a predator 
and they do that, for instance, in murky water, they still know that the predator is approaching or that there is a prey, uh, even though uh, they cannot actually see the, uh, uh, the, the predator or whatever. And it was discovered that in some fishes, some of the chemicals that are sniffed um, to feel the approach of a predator are damaged uh, by acidification. And so it is um, necessary for the ba bass fry uh, they have to be 40% closer to the predator to realize that the predator is there and that, that it's too late then, they cannot escape. So acidification increases, the small fishes, the fry are no longer capable of realizing that the predator is approaching um, because they realize when the predator is too close. So the population of this fish dwindle, decrease in numbers, and this of course, gives us also a measure of the economic impact of all this. If you want to have a nice uh, bass uh, fried uh, or baked, well, it's going to be quite expensive because it's going to cost you much more. So this study here that uh, you see on the slide uh, dates back to 2016. It's quite uh, a bit outdated, but it is a study that can that considered all the various aspects and the way in which all the problems are interrelated. So there are impacts uh, on uh, aquaculture, uh, on uh, oysters whose lava, because of acidification, are unable to feed sufficiently, so their production is much lower. So also aquaculture is unable to be productive. Productivity of these farms become uh, reduced unless the larvae are collected and they are grown, uh, but it's too expensive. Um, fishery and aquaculture with these effects on signaling and the interaction with the messages, all these effects have an impact on the biodiversity. Now they're being measured, but it's quite recent, so we're still, you know, uh, have very limited data. They have an impact on ecosystems, and uh, we know that the Mediterranean is made up of countries that live uh, of tourism, sea tourism, underwater tourism, and also, you know, restaurants when you want to eat fish in Greece and Spain and Italy. Well, every, all this sector is heavily affected by the effects of acidification on ecosystems and living organisms. So in this perspective, it is a problem that we don't hear much about, but it is a problem that is very burdensome and it will be even worse. So our actions now are going to be effective in a while and if we do not take any steps now, well, the results are going to come very late. And this is another study, an analysis of what is being studied. Um, so at the, what is being studied at the moment on acidification in the Mediterranean. There are two aspects. Look at the map, which is divided, which divides the Mediterranean in Eastern and Western Mediterranean. And look how many studies are carried out on Western Mediterranean, quite a lot of studies, well, most and how few studies are conducted on the Eastern Mediterranean, Western and Eastern. So which basin at this very time is more affected by acidification? Eastern Mediterranean, of course. And we are studying the wrong part, well, not the wrong part, but we are focusing on resources mainly where the effects are less uh, strong at the moment. If you look at the other chart, what are the types of studies which are being conducted? Well, lab studies on living organisms, that is, li uh, lab um, studies, because on the field studies are more expensive, but of course what you study on in the lab is much less, so the amount of organisms that you study and the type of modeling you can create is much smaller. And then specific situations such as uh, areas where there is a natural uh, acidification, where there are thermal springs. So normal situations, for instance, uh, what is nearby. Uh, so what is needed at the moment is having uh, studies concerning effects of, on organisms that should be more homogeneous from a geographical perspective. And I think that 
coverage should, should be expanded. Now, we know effects on a number of species and we generalize. It's as if a writer wished to to write a novel just using a hundred words it would be complicated. And the same goes for us. Our knowledge on the bio biological effects of acidification is like having a hundred words versus a complete dictionary. So you don't really know a language if you just master a hundred words. And then another thing which is much more complicated and it does not depend on us, we should integrate scientific studies with socioeconomic studies and uh, governments should uh, be consistent in terms of their policies on acidification. And I also used to go underwater before. Um, this is a picture of myself. Thank you, Marco, uh, for your presentation. It's very interesting as well. It's very worrying for the systemic system uh, effects, sorry, that uh, we don't really realize are there. So you were talking about the lack of consistent policies on the topic of acidification, and I'm soon going to give the floor to Juan uh, on this aspect. But before doing that, I would like to give the floor to Jaume Piera, because I know that at six o'clock he has to leave. So um, I wish him to give, I wish to give him enough time to speak about a very important aspect. So we heard the, 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 about the importance of political decisions. Um, and there is also another very important aspect, which is represented by awareness and the action of citizens. And um, so there is citizen science and uh, monitoring and concrete actions. So he is going to tell us more about it and the floor goes to him. Sorry, I, I do not speak Italian. Um, Great. So <laughs> I will try to, uh, well, I have to do it in, 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 in English. Uh, should I have to share my screen right now? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay. See? Yes, okay. So, yes, thank you, because I think it was a very interesting introduction. Uh, thank you to the um, previous speakers, and particularly Professor Marco, because he connects very much with uh, what I am um, planning to talk about. It's basically the, the role of people and uh, the volunteers in ocean acidification monitoring, but also in ecosystem restoration. So, as it has been mentioned before, you know, uh, now we, we will have several sociological uh, challenges because the human activity and, and the different, you know, interests in terms of uh, economic views or ways of thinking, how we, we take, have to take benefit from, from nature and the consequences of, of, of on taking such a kind of strategies or approaches. Uh, the problem is that as a society, we have many ways to think about that. And, and I put here two of the, I would say, um, yeah, significant leaders that uh, probably they think very different from us, or at least from uh, some of us, in terms of how nature has to be, you know, uh, treated in, in terms of economical and, sociolog and sociological. Uh, that controversy, and um, the problem is that, as Professor Marco was mentioned, in many cases, the main problem on addressing such a kind of controversy is the lack of information. The problem is that um, we, we should have what is called evidence-based policies. The policies need to be, you know, um, uh, the decisions need to be um, taken with evidence and knowledge systems. And the problem is that we do not have such a kind of information in many cases. So several of the decisions that are taken by the governments are, are just, you, you know, in, in, in with the few words that Professor Michael was mentioning. So we are trying, you know, to take decisions from the whole message, just knowing very few words of the whole system, of the whole message. So how we could um, improve this? Basically, um, well, in a simple world, uh, word, as we, we think that we need more data, more data from all the places, um, Professor Marco was mentioned this big difference between, for example, the Western and um, Eastern Mediterranean in, in terms of knowledge and also the best quality. Um, and 
one of the ideas, and it was already exposed by Vanessa and, and, and the rest of the speakers, it was, you know, this idea of creating such a kind of advanced technology, technological observatories. Um, these provide, you know, very accurate, or they can provide uh, accurate um, measurements of different parameters. Um, and this ca can provide a very significant and valuable information. But on the other hand, there is also the possibility to engage people. Because if we need, um, you know, information and data from everywhere all the times, people are everywhere all the times doing, you know, sometimes their own work, artist fishing, artisanal fisheries, for example, they go day by day to the different locations in the different coastal areas, people doing kayaking, sailing, uh, snorkeling, diving, and all these kind of people doing this kind of activity, they have the potential to provide us essential information. Nevertheless, um, some people say, well, yeah, they, they could provide, but, but they will never provide the, um, the measurements of the observations with the accuracy that we can obtain with professional instruments. And that's right. But we think that we should have to think in a more holistic way because they do not only provide information, but also they are involved in the process. Uh, I tried here to, to put this innovation framework that I started with a type triple helix. At the beginning, people, they, they thought that we should, you know, combine or collaborate better or uh, establish better connections between industry, academy, and government. And this is right. And this creates this triple helix. But later on, the people say, no, why not involve also the people, the civil organizations? And this creates this quadruple helix. And now we are, you know, evolving to this quintuple helix in which we, we consider also um, the, the, the environment, the engagement or the situation um, of, of the environment. And in particular here, I, I, you know, I highlighted, usually there is like this global warming, this marine litter, but also this ocean acidification. This is what is considered sometimes, you know, this socio-ecological transition. And this is basically, for example, um, I have, you know, the, the pleasure to collaborate with uh, Professor um, Juanjo Daño Beitia in one of the projects called Minke. And in, in this one, we, we try to, en to enlarge um, what is called, you know, uh, or you, we can imagine this network of high accurate instruments that are more or less these dots, black and white um, uh, and, and red in, in, the, in the first map, combined with um, uh, measurements coming from the people. And this could be, you know, uh, uh, an ideal situation. And I try to in, in explain you graphically why. So ideally, we could think that if we need to, to get the information, for example, from um, pH or the temperature, we, we, will, we would like to have, you know, stations all over the coast, if we think in terms of coast. So may imagine that we can collect all these data with very accurate in, instruments. Um, but this means that we have all these instruments in every single station. In, in real uh, scenarios, this never happened. Um, it, having every single, you know, base in, in the coast connected or in monitored with accurate instruments, it's too expensive. So basically what we do, it's either we select different strategic points, selected points along the coast or even in the ocean. And this provides, you know, a few uh, measurements from the whole system, but very accurate. But also we can consider this idea of engage people that they could provide um, many um, measurements along the coast with much uh, simpler um, instruments that obviously this will create this kind of noisy. You can see that, in, that the, these blue dots that follows a little bit the pattern, but with, in a noisy way. But if we think, uh, and this is the main idea of Vinke, that we can combine the red measurements connected with very accurate instruments with the blue ones, connected with the people and through these data fusion systems, we could collect the optimal measurements. You can see that basically what we pretend is to collect this green um, line at the end, that it's very much close to the reference one that it was the black one. So that's the idea. Um, so in terms of engaging, engaging people, we may think in the, this idea, you know, to, to collect people. But also I would like to, to consider that this is only one of the aspects or important aspects in terms of how to engage volunteers. They could monitor with low cost, providing such a kind of blue data that I mentioned here. But also they can track acidification using bioindicators. And also what is very important, they could be involved in restoration activities, which is the very, uh, you know, the second part. We only not, we could also 
make changes because at the end it's a societal change we can involve them in the part of the restoration and i will not go very deeply on on, on these three aspects but i ju just want to show you three examples of each of them um, the first one is this idea of collecting with low-cost systems um, there are several low-cost systems for ph there are some discussions if they are accurate enough but for example, I, I would like to mention this one because I, I, I identify this as a very promising device. This is an optical device. And, um, and basically, I would just would like to show you that this is um, the reference with this instrument, the measurements with these instruments, and the measurements with a, a classical glass electrode of pH. And you can see that the line is very well. You can see that error, but taking into account the scale of that error. So that means that potentially with this type of devices, of new devices, we, we could also provide accurate measurements that will be available for the people. And this could be, you know, installed, obviously it could be installed in a, in a classical way, and, but also could be, you know, finally, why not put in a kayak system or in a sailing boat that could provide this kind of accurate measurements, which I think that is a combination between what we think in terms of accurate uh, networks and also the one that are collected by, by the people. Uh, well, it, uh, I found very interesting that uh, Professor Marco already mentioned this. Obviously there are several um, organisms that are affected by acidification. So imagine that people can take pictures of this type of shells, for example, and I'm not going deep on that, but for example, now there are several um, automatic identification or, you know, computer vision systems that are able, you know, to measure with quite accurate um, approach um, the, the level of, of erosion on, on the shells. And this, imagine that many people collecting pictures from many places, we could map some areas in which the acidification is more, you know, um, richer or, 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 or less, which I think it's a, another way, you know, to engage uh, the people. And finally, just to put on, on the, 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 the last example, uh, we, we should consider, you know, the, the potential role of people or, on being involved on this idea of, um, you know, restoring, for example, coral reefs and being part because people are aware of the problem of, for example, on, on coral reefs you 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 the acidification and obviously the number of people that could be involved as a volunteers it's much much larger than the ones just if we consider professionals so training people on doing this kind of restoration activities could be a potential a very very strong and cost effective way you know to restore uh, such a kind of ecosystems in the future and basically this is what uh, I would like the message if if I um, just if you want as a kind of um, and measure is that idea that volunteers can provide such a kind of different roles in in the in the in the society um, in terms of collecting data that is very important for us because there are many missing gaps as Professor Marco was mentioning this idea not only you know this big difference between uh, Eastern and Western Mediterranean but also at very local scales there are many areas in which there is no data so and engaging people, they can provide not only this missing data, but also they, they, they be fully aware of the problem on that. And also they could act, you know, later on as a helping us on restoration, the ecosystems. So thank you very much. And I will end up in this part. Grazie, grazie. Grazie. Grazie, Jaume, davvero per... thank you, Jaume. Thank you very much for explaining to us how citizens can become watchdogs in a sense, in the field of widespread monitoring and uh, to what extent they can play an important role. I know that you must leave soon and I wanted to ask you something. Are there concrete examples in which the role of citizens has already been implemented? I don't know, uh, examples in Spain or in other European countries where citizens can participate. I, I would like to be a volunteer also for the summer to collect data uh, if this is possible, of course ongoing activities and I think that the system will increase more and more because it's essential that um, we, we need to engage the society um, for the monitoring systems you know there is no um, way you know to to address these needs of data in a cost-effective way and and yeah you are more than welcome and 
you know, to participate and, and the rest of you. Um, and uh, yeah, Juanjo is also aware. And Minke, we, we have started several platforms um, um, for, for reporting now biology, but um, in in few months, we will get also environmental variables. And hopefully there will be some, these low cost systems that can provide, you know, essential information uh, about these essential ocean variables. And I'm very sorry, I need to leave. And thank you very much for leaving the opportunity to talk. And, and I hope that we will see each other in another occasion. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, Jaume. Grazie per essere stato con noi. Davvero buon thank lavoro. Thank you so much. Um, all the best, and we will follow what you do closely. Thank you. Of course, if there are questions or comments you wish to make, they are more than welcome. I will ask short questions to our participants, our protagonists, and to refer to some of the aspects we have spoken about, and there is so much food for thought. But I would like to begin from Wanko asking uh, him about the political aspect in, term of, in terms of political choices. Well, this is a, a challenging topic, of course, but we've seen that there is such a level of complexity, and we were also talking about it before we began this meeting, for instance, when we were speaking about microplastics. And um, so everything that happens in the water column, which is what you deal with with Emso, Eric, and uh, so we heard what Marco Oliverio was talking about also in terms of positive feedback effects. Uh, we don't really know what is going to happen, how much the acidification impact can increase. So all this complexity, um, um, how does it reach those who must make decisions in order to fight against the increase of acidification in your experience, what can be done at this level? Well, these are very complicated questions where there are many players or actors. Indeed, everybody is a player in this game. In the first place, what we do at the level of science is to provide information, very accurate information about what is happening. Not only because we, we are deep sea floor people, and most of the time we listen about what happened in the surface, which is absolutely important, but it's not the only thing important in the acidification. Probably Marco Oliveiro, indeed, I have many Marcos here, Marco Oliveiro, Matteo, and Galeotti, two Marcos. I am the only <laughs> not Marco. <laughs> Super Mark, I am surrounded by Marcos, which is good. And um, uh, we think that uh, acidification uh, decreases by going down, but we don't have too much information. There is another thing which uh, will, the carbon compensation depth, which is something important, the other thing you mentioned. At the level of the citizen was a spectacular what uh, Jauma is suffering because it is clear by increasing the number of sensors. And I think something that Marco um, Jauma didn't say clearly is you should have a very well calibration. If you have very well calibration when you have a lot of sensors, the increase in signal to noise ratio is absolutely spectacular. And we saw it in the, in the graphic uh, he showed. And then we have at the end of the whole chain, citizens, they can do citizen science. You are voluntary already, you say today. So, <laughs> and then uh, we can measure many things. Uh, we can provide, we can have a lot of respect to keep the health of the ocean. But one thing is fundamental, society. And when I say society means politician and economy should be together. I already uh, listen and, uh, uh, read about economies who are predicting by 2030, 2050, an impact on the global economy, which is in the order of five points on the gross domestic uh, product, which is incredible amount of money. And there are people who are completely sure they predict by the end of the century, I don't know if you still voluntary by that time, <laughs> a, a loss of $500 million per year 
So even if you don't care too much about acidification, if you are an industry, you should reconsider whatever you are doing in order for not only to preserve the planet, but to preserve your economy and the economy of, of the people. And this is a slightly changing in the mentality of our politicians because you say, well, how much goes to do this? And they say, how much is going to, we're going to pay in the next coming 10 years? Well, we're, in the beginning, we were talking about in the next coming 10 years. Now we're talking in the next uh, half a year almost because these things are evolving at such a speed. And uh, well, Mark Oliveiro talk about direct and indirect impact, which are enormous, not only in the spigola del mare tirreno, no? Okay, importante, but in many other things. And uh, one thing is becoming an issue is the, for the first time, and uh, I don't know if you, uh, all of us, we said that Europe has the conscience that we need to work together. This is a global thing. And many people say, well, it is important for the more developed countries, not, not for the more developed countries. I think we have a, pro a serious problem in the Mediterranean because we have a high quality data in the northern part of the Mediterranean, but we don't have much on the southern part of the Mediterranean. And this is a serious problem because all these, and Vanessa knows much more than me about this, all these oceanographic models have shows a gap. And this gap is produced because we need to go there to prepare these people and to avoid that these people are coming so many so often uh, without any possibility to go back because we need to transfer the knowledge also to these Northern European countries. So what I want to say with this is, is an incredible complex uh, system. Apparently our stakeholders and politicians, they learn, they understood that they need to do something. Well, for instance, simple things like recently, many, well, not, not many, but some, Insurance company are already asking at MSOEDI, hey, we want to know what is happening with the acidification. We want to know what is happening with the climate change and say, why? Because we need to change probably the quota of the insurance. Means already that the economy already say, hey, attention, attention, something happened here. And now we, what our duty is to push with good data. I mean, we, all the Marcos and myself, to the authorities to say, you should take care about this because this will impact not only you, but the whole population in the Mediterranean basin and all over the planet. I could talk much more, but I stop here. But it's messages. Oh, wait. Uh, the message is, is clear. Thank you. Uh, Juanjo, vorrei uh, a questo punto coinvolgere Vanessa Cardin, che appunto annuiva e si sentiva. So, uh, of course, now Vanessa Cardin. Um, so, uh, also in relation to what you mentioned in your presentation relating to the Moon Goes Consortium and what can be done on this front, as mentioned by Juanjo. Yeah, uh, in fact, I just wanted to answer, and uh, well, actually, Franco did it already. Um, the first thing that I would like to understand within OGS, we had an app, and uh, also something that relates to jellyfishes. And at the beginning, the process was quite slow, but then uh, after a few years, they have become a data source absolutely important and they feel involved in what is happening in our sea. And also among the various things, we all have, for, for instance, our mobile phones and uh, uh, of course we are geo-referenced. So when data is sent, or with the uh, various shells, etc., it is possible to know where they were found, where they are, and this is a an important indication. But then, as to the quantity of data, this is true. Uh, the real problem in the Mediterranean and in the Eastern Mediterranean, in particular, is that there's uh, 
But based on the studies we have from Mungus, um, and we have uh, and we are sharing data, we see that the Western Mediterranean is uh, well monitored, both uh, from different types of instruments and also infrastructures, whereas the um, uh, Eastern Mediterranean is much less, and almost nothing is happening at the level of the uh, African coast, as Juanco mentioned. So what happens here is that and uh, uh, we have uh, our technology but if we have no data from them uh, well this becomes a problem and uh, we have a clear technology that they don't have sometimes the data and it's difficult um, so we can increase in this way the quality of our models and in this way it is possible to have better results and we would have all of the uh, countries in the south bank of the Mediterranean that would benefit from this situation. So just a couple of words on Moon Goose and I'm the chair of Moon Goose. Um, it has four pillars. One is to improve uh, the um, vision of uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and also the science to favor, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the society and societal benefits, to collaborate and promote visibility, to promote visibility and recognition of the service and uh, within the governmental agencies and private companies by encouraging also their integration nationally, regionally, and at European level. And thirdly, capacity building. This is very important, and it was mentioned already, and Wuhanko is uh, uh, also a specific transfer of knowledge it is therefore uh, important uh, to adopt international initiatives that promote uh, for instance participation of mediterranean countries especially for the production of these services and also to improve uh, the availability of services which are already existing and present in the mediterranean uh, because the Mediterranean countries need to have uh, a high ability in terms of production of uh, services. And also, um, they are very useful for in terms of uh, implementation of policies. And also, uh, for instance, uh, well, this represents uh, a benefit for everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks. But I wanted to involve uh, Marco Galeotti again, because as we said, uh, there are some politicians that have started to understand, but some private companies uh, are just asking, well, what's gonna happen in the next few years? And since Marco Galeotti is also the industry officer of ENSO, I'd like to ask him how to interact with the private sector and how to involve it and how to persuade them to act, to change things. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, we are very much active at a European level in order to uh, push some of the Commission to finance a European network supporting uh, research infrastructures to help them to have uh, continuous relations with industries. Very often, And sometimes they are suppliers of the infrastructures. So we have worked and uh, there's a European network, which is called Enriched Network, which is nearly 100 organizations involved and interested in providing a future, let's say, to this network. And uh, we hope 
Well, in this moment, we don't have enough funds to finalize the establishment of the network and of the European hub, but hopefully this is going to happen soon. But of course, we as operators have recognized the need to be supported in uh, our framework and in this specific framework. And uh, internally, as ENSO, our relation with the industry is based on three pillars. One is training. Two, the second one, uh, where possible, it's important to try and uh, involve the small and medium enterprises. And the third one, is to ensure physical access and, and also ensure uh, the participation of the private sector. And this is the second year that EMSO ensures uh, physical access to uh, infrastructures and uh, to regional facilities with a great success. And uh, in this period, uh, we are testing a new sensor to measure the pH, which will be at a zero cost. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, if you have any questions, please, I have a difficult question to Marco, just to close. So if you wanna ask any question or if you wanna make any comments or remarks, please. The difficult question is the following. Maybe it's not difficult, but in my mind, so it is. Sometimes we have some good news. For instance, the international commitment to protect 30% of oceans by 2030 uh, or to have protected areas. Also, then we need to completely understand What's next? But when it comes to a phenomenon like acidification, which is a consequence of the interaction with the atmosphere, and where you can isolate and protect a marine area as much as you want, but that is a, uh, a fundamental dynamic. Can we be optimist? and think that these measures are gonna be useful to protect somehow the marine ecosystems and wildlife. Um, could you please show once again uh, my slides? The, I'll show you. Well, optimism must always be there. We have to be optimists, otherwise we have to change our job. Um, the, the other slide, okay, that one. The uh, mechanisms at the basis of the functioning of ecosystems are so complex and uh, the actors are so many that wherever we uh, intervene and whatever action we carry out, we have consequences. So yes, the acidification process per se is complex and also integrated in the environment. Well, in any case, it has the possibility to be somehow uh, buffered or uh, limited. The fact that we can't stop it entirely doesn't mean that we can't intervene, slow down the trends. Uh, for instance, we saw uh, that there's uh, an increase in the CO2. Okay, maybe we cannot stop it entirely, but we can slow it down. And that's one thing that apparently has nothing to do with the acidification, but as a matter of fact, it is potentially fully involved in it. Uh, cetaceans, for instance, according to whether they are, uh, for instance, uh, um, whales, etc., they play a role Because, of course, with their edification, uh, they provide nutrition to the phytoplankton to grow. And we saw that the phytoplankton and the microscopic uh, organisms that are present in the oceans, they participate in uh, the elimination of CO2. And they do that because they need it uh, for the photosynthesis. 
and uh, therefore they need nutrition and also And they uh, play a role in the transportation of nutrients. Um, for instance, whales do that from the depth up to the surface. Uh, so they do that in different ways, but they play a role in the oceans. And they do that in an important way. So the uh, policies adopted in our planet uh, for the hunting to great uh, cetaceans, uh, well, negatively impact what well, two nations, that is say Norway and Denmark. The rest of the world, actually, um, well, they constantly um, have a negotiation, or with Japan as well, sorry, but they constantly have a negotiation on uh, uh, this item because the so-called whale countries say they don't want to step back, say they don't want to change their minds. So uh, countries are asked to act differently in other matters. And that is the reason why uh, something happens based on which politics decides that at a certain point, if some whales extinguish, uh, it's not a disaster, but probably we need to have in return a protection of the Amazon uh, uh, um, but this is not the case because the role played with these organisms is integrated in the ecosystems and the effect. If we remove whales, we are removing a portion of the feeding and the portion of nutrients for the phytoplankton, whereas if we have an increase in the population of cetaceans, there will be an increase in the quantity of phytoplankton and there would also be an in uh, a difference in the percentage of CO2, and we would limit and slow down the effects of acidification. So these uh, are different options we have, but I'm very much convinced about it because in Italy we don't have a big culture from this point of view, but we need to deal with it more. But we are scientists, we are good in doing things. I'm happy that we're part of this category and we react as well to a lot of situations and we are reacting to the need to uh, share information, etc. And uh, I am proud to say that we are quite good in doing things. And in Italy, we are relatively good at these things. One thing we uh, do less well is to tell to the rest of the world uh, what we do. So to tell to billions of people around us what we do, and also to give the feeling or the impression what we do is important and give the knowledge and public awareness and share with the rest of the population the urgency of some matters. We are not able to do that, but maybe Greta Thunberg is able to do that better than us. But if we participate in this phase as well, uh, and of course, there's no training at universities to learn and uh, do scientific communication, and also to communicate with journalists and to be able to uh, make a joint venture with them. And uh, this is uh, the case of Italy in particular. And recently, we are getting equipped because at university, we do the third mission. So we are starting to do that, but we are still at the Paleolithic age. But if we learned how to do that, we, well, probably once uh, this awareness increases, then policymakers are, have to be liable because Policymakers have to be uh, liable to the population. And uh, um, so we cannot uh, ask all policymakers to be enlightened, but we have to work. And this is a claim I'm making to my colleagues and myself first. Learn and uh, intervene and learn how to communicate to the outside and do that in a better way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. So, I, oh, there's a question over there. My comment uh, relates to the fact that we were not educated and we don't feel that this is a role. 
Noi dobbiamo un po' switchare la nostra testa rispetto We a questo. Dobbiamo cambiare qualcosa nel nostro mente quando si tratta di questo ruolo e di questo commitment, che è chiesto dalla società. Perché i nostri messaggi sono basati su evidenza scientifica. Qui. bisogna lavorare insieme e nell'accademia veramente c'è all together there's a lot to do within the academia allora eh, Juanjo deve, vuole fare una domanda credo yeah because I have many Marcos here will, which I don't understand very well uh, according to you when they increase the acidification decrease the biodiversity no? Oh, no, not, it's not obvious, but we have less, uh, I mean, in extreme situation that we have a lot of acidification, the level of uh, life decrease. But then this is the question. I show here today, hydrothermal vents, where the temperature is very high and the acidification is very high. And then, The nature is so intelligent and instead of doing the photosynthesis, it's doing the chemiosynthesis. So at the end, the life recuperates in a different way. So to some extent, this is a sort of contradiction. You say, well, if you became more acid, we have a solution. Well, if I say this, somebody is going to kill me <laughs> at the door. I mean, In, and there are many hydrothermal vents all over the planet. In the beginning, we thought it was few, but there are many. And this is happening in all the hydrothermal vents. So why? Do you know? <laughs> in Italian or in English? Okay. Uh, okay, in Italian. Uh, noi non vogliamo un mondo we don't want a world transformed into a gigantic hydrothermal band. The hydrothermal bands, well, we know them because this was the uh, oceanographic discovery of the 20th century. They are oases in an ocean of mud at 300, uh, 3,000 meters of depth. But where there are hydrothermal uh, bands, so uh, warm water, rich in gases, gas is coming from the breaking of the crust. So we have these very hot gases that heat the water and provide heat, and also gases that are used by bacteria that trigger communities. So uh, they discovered them and saw that there's this um, uh, huge amount of uh, uh, There's mud, 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 and then a shrimp, then a fat mud, 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 another fish, and then an oasis I in the desert, rich in life. So it is true there are um, several, um, there's also a biodiversity. And there are organisms that have learned to be there, and they are in the oceans. This doesn't mean, however, well, that is an acid area. This doesn't mean that if we acidify the oceans to increase the biodiversity. It's just that in the specific area, that condition led to the development of adjustments and adaptations. But if we acidify, uh, and we have organisms that are not used to acidification, the other part of biodiversity is lost. So yes, we may transform our planet into a gigantic hydrothermal vent. So we may transform our uh, planet into a gigantic hydrothermal vent and have some hundreds of species or thousands of species as compared to the millions of species we have now. But of course, we would not be in a better position. Okay, okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Marco Galeotti and uh, Juanto and Marco Liberio, Vanessa Gartinja, Jaume, uh, connected remotely. And uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Arrivederci.